All right, so we'll call the select board meeting uh, to order for Wednesday, August 18th, 2021. This meeting is being recorded, correct, Jennifer? Is that back recording? Recording in, in progress. All right, now it is being recorded and it's also being uh, broadcast and beyond Hadley Media. Uh, from the select board, we have uh, John Weskevitz, David Phil, uh, Jane Nevin Smith, Amy Parsons, and Joyce Trunglow here. And all votes will be taken via roll call. This is also a meeting of the finance committee as well. And from the finance committee, we have, let's see, I'll go through this. I'm flipping through my phone. Alexi's here. Uh, we have Valerie Hood and Dylan's here. And Amy, five minutes, and she'll be here in five minutes. Okay, no problem. So our first uh, thing on the agenda for tonight, 2.1, is the audit presentation by Powers and Sullivan. And who do we have from Powers and Sullivan? Todd, yep. Sorry, <laughs> I had That's to okay. find the right button on mute myself. Hi, everybody. I uh, just want to, hey, sorry, what was that? Uh, oh. I uh, just want to thank the board for giving uh, giving me the opportunity to come uh, come and present. It's always, um, especially in the year of a, what we would in the audit industry refer to as initial audit. You know, first time town having uh, having the town as a client. It's always great to see the faces behind the phone calls and names I may have read um, along the way. Um, so I, I just want to give a I guess a, 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 big, a big thanks to the town staff. Um, obviously this past year, as we all aware, um, you know, basically in, the, in every aspect of our life, um, you know, we had approached things differently. This remote was 100% remote, uh, this audit was 100% remote. Normally we would have been set up camp at town hall for, you know, at least a good week, maybe a little bit more. Um, so everybody adapted to all the new technologies that were put in place, and uh, you know we had a we have an online secure web-based portal that um, you know all it took was a phone call or a, a quick email to either Lori or or Linda. If it wasn't the two of them, it was passed on to whoever the appropriate party was, and you know in a matter without significant delay, the requested items were uploaded to our portal for uh, for audit. So it was overall, it was a successful audit. We, we started, physically started the audit probably right around the turn of the calendar year. So right around uh, January 1, just after New Year's, if I have my timeline correct. Um, so um, overall, as, um, if some of you have had the chance to review the financial statements, it's been a clean audit, okay? What we mean by that is the opinion was unqualified, and in the audit um, in the audit arena, that's the best you can get. Okay, that means that essentially you have a clean bill of health um, in your financial statements, and um, and you can rely rely on the numbers that are that are presented to make decisions, you know, ongoing and um, going forward. So, congratulations there. Um, you know, all assets, all liabilities, um, you know, net pension liability, your net OPEB liability, we'll discuss those a little bit further. They all seem sound. Um, so no issues there. Now, being being the first year, just wanted to kind of introduce, um, introduce our process a little bit, how we go about the audit. I imagine it's not too different than what you would have experienced in the past, but we take the town's financial statements. Um, the only thing we own in the financial statements is our opinion. Um, everything else is prepared by the town. Um, you know, we, we take the town's VADAR ledgers and any other outside um, records that are kept by the treasurer, collector, um, assessor, so on and so forth. And those, all, the, all that material is reviewed. Uh, we, walk, we walk down, it's all the way down to your capital assets, um, all your buildings, your vehicles, everything that you own. And then on the flip side, you know, we 
we look at all the debt that's outstanding. Um, as I said before, the net pension liability, net OPEP liability. So we spend a lot of time um, really understanding what's in the town's financial statements. Um, and this being, as I said before, an initial audit, um, we spent a considerable amount of time trying to understand what we call the beginning balances. So where did the fiscal year 19 audit leave off with um, the numbers that were presented, uh, say for your ending general fund fund balance in, under, in FY19, was that reasonable? Uh, we don't re-audit everything that the prior auditor would have done, but we have to do some due diligence on that. Um, so it, there's uh, along the way we get to know that as well as you, but um, we, we, do, we do gain a good understanding. Um, you know, we, we pestered Linda a lot for bank statements and investment statements. Um, she works a lot with the town's actuaries that uh, calculate the net OPEB liability. She fed us information on that. We look at invoices, cash receipts, um, payroll records, you know, all, all that we, as we deem it necessary along the way. So you're, um, the books are laid wide open, as they say. Um, you know, we, we don't we don't take shortcuts, and um, it's a it's a sound audit. Um, so the at the end result, um, as I said, we had no no other than a, a, a legacy comment that was in the FY19 management letter. No concerns with internal control over financial reporting. Uh, we certainly think that anything that's presented especially now going forward, um, anything that's presented to you daily, monthly, quarterly, whatever the process is that helps the board or the finance committee uh, from a managerial uh, point of view, you can rely on that. Um, um, you know, you, you can sleep easily at night, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, so I guess before I go in and jump into the actual reports themselves, a financial statement, the management letter. Is there any questions that anyone may, anyone on the board of the finance committee may have as far as the process? Um, if not, I'll plow forward. So, um, okay. So right now, in, in I believe in your agenda packets, there were two reports that were presented. One was the management letter, I'll get into that. One was obviously the basic financial statements themselves. Um, the town hasn't been presenting a report on federal awards. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because in a couple exit conferences um, where the town may not have had any uh, federal, federal expenditures that qualify, I was getting questions on why aren't we reporting on it. The federal government doesn't require City, any governmental entity that expends less than $750,000 in federal awards to have um, an independent auditor look at those. So in FY20, you've expend, expended about $350,000, um, somewhere around that amount. My expectation is going forward um, with all the stimulus money, if it's not in FY21, probably certainly in 22 and beyond for a few years, you'll, you'll have... Um, you'll uh, have to undergo an audit of your federal expenditures um, on any federal awards you may have. And there's a process behind that. And whenever that bridge gets crossed, I'm certainly available to discuss that process with whoever um, wants to know more. So, um, so that's enough said on that. As far as the management letter, um, there were eight comments that were presented in this letter. And um, I think I may have meant use the word legacy comments uh, a few minutes ago. These were comments that were presented by the prior auditing firm. Um, um, however, you know, we don't discount those. We actually do take the time and try and follow up and understand uh, what was presented in them. There were, so in the FY20, FY19 management letter, which really wasn't issued until after the close of fiscal year 20, right? This was during a time where the town was going through some personnel changes and various financial roles and whatnot. Um, 
a lot of what the prior orders noted in FY19, really the, the, the opportunity to correct for management to correct itself and address this, it, it, that opportunity didn't exist. Um, um, or sure, certainly didn't exist, I guess, in a sufficient amount of time that would have allowed management to, to uh, rectify these within the FY20 timeframe. So as a result, most of those comments in 19 were repeated. Um, and various discussions I've had with Linda and Lori uh, during the course of the audit, I would be highly um, surprised if, if, if all these are gonna be repeated in the FY21 management letter, uh, especially the comment, there was a material weakness presented in 2019 um, and by default in 2020 regarding um, how the budget was recorded on the ledger. Um, there wasn't any indication, you know, of a fraud going on. It was, it's more a clerical, you know, of how things got posted up to the recap worksheet and how it tied into the town's general ledger and then roll it back comparing it to town meeting votes. Um, I'm, I'm right now on confidence and certainly we're going to keep beating, you know, we will beat this up again as the FY21 audit progresses. Um, but in my discussions with Lori, it, it sounds like there's a, uh, uh, a, a, a good framework to prevent this from mater uh, materializing again in the future. Um, so outside of, the, outside of that one material weakness, um, two of the comments were actually did resolve. Well, one resolved itself in FY20. One of them, you know, there's maybe another hurdle to get over, but certainly some progress um, in regards to um, the warrant cutoffs um, and, and how they were, uh, some warrants were processed after the July 15th um, statutory cutoff date. Um, but even that, might, even that I expect to resolve. Um, the other comments that were presented in the management letter were what I would refer to more as a process and best practice type comment. Nothing to lose sleep over, um, you know, nothing that, you know, to, to worry about over the course of time, but it's just, you know, um, if we see something that can, you know, help a municipality kind of improve itself, we, we offer the guidance when appropriate. So uh, again, all these will be followed up in FY21. Um, we will report back to the town when we issue the 21 management letter, which I'm assuming will be a lot sooner than it was for this cycle. So moving on to the financial statements, there's only, there's three, there's a lot of information in here. I'm certainly not gonna discuss everything. If you have any questions, I can, we can discuss it. But the three areas that really get a lot of, um, a lot of attention, uh, at least my experience, is the um, net pension liability, the net OPEB liability, and then the general fund budget itself. So um, I'll just start off hitting, um, talking about those, and again, I can field any questions after that. So the net OPEB li liability, that is a liability that is, um, I'm going to use the word regulated, may not be the, the right term, but the, the pension, municipal pension system in the state, as you're all well aware, it's highly regulated by state legislation and certain regulations that are issued by um, various state oversight boards um, that govern the various pension systems in the state. Uh, this information that gets recorded in the town's financial statements comes from your regional retirement system. And um, and it's based on information contained in their audited financial statements. So this is, you know, the town's ability to directly impact this, this liability, it's somewhat muted. I suppose there's some indirect ways that right now I can't really uh, imagine, but they may be there. So the net pension liability, which would have been measured as of December 31, 19, that was the latest um, available set of financial statements uh, from the from your regional retirement system. 
the liability was about ten and a half million dollars at that time. The net pension liability, um, which was pretty much in line with um, after everything shook out, all the various calculations that the system's actuary goes through, um, it was pretty much in line with the net pension liability at um, at FY19. So there really wasn't much movement in there. And my guess is that that was more uh, uh, due to the performance of the investments, uh, but without having audited that financial entity myself, um, I can't speak to that 100%. Um, so, and, and the assumptions that are, oh, sorry, was there a question? Oh, okay. Uh, the assumptions that are used that the actuary did use to calculate the net pension liability, it's pretty much in line with what I what I've, we see in other communities. Um, there's nothing that seems to be out of whack. Their investment rate of return is about 7.7%. Some systems are getting down to in the high sixes, dep um, you know, depending on how the retirement board acts. You know, if they lower their investment rate of return assumption, your liability could creep higher. But um, again, that's just, I guess, talking to the wind right now. But to give you an idea of how the net pension liability may change, given changes in various inputs that go into the liability, if you look on page um, 52 of the financial statements, there's, there's presented... Um, a sensitivity analysis that's required disclosure by GASB. Um, so if, if the investment rate of return goes down by a, a whole 1%, um, you, you know, you'd, you'd be looking at a net pension liability that's about three and a half, uh, actually about $3 million higher than what it is now. But, um, and then conversely, if I don't think we will ever get back to 8% assumptions, but if it went back to 8%, it would obviously it would um, decrease. So there is some uh, if you if you want to know more the you know, the the notes to the net pension liability than at OPEB um, certainly kind of gives a good road roadmap of, of the assumptions used and where things may end up. And certainly I'm always available for more in depth this uh, questions if they present themselves. Um, as far as the net OPEB liability. So this one, this, this liability is more under the town's direct control, right? The town has planned design over the health insurance offerings and, um, you know, in conjunction with its employee unions and union contracts and whatnot, it, um, you know, you had the opportunity to determine co-payments, to determine you know, how much the towns are going to tr contribute towards an active employee or a retiree's um, premium. Um, in various, there's various inputs that you have some control over. Um, this one, again, this liability is calculated by an advisor or uh, by an actuary that is hired by the town directly. Um, and both of the, act, actually, both of the actuaries um, used by the pension system and for the town itself, we're, fam we're familiar with these firms. Uh, we, we've, we've encountered them a lot over the past 10 years. They, they're, they seem to be well versed in what they're doing. Um, the net OPEB liability for the town at 63020, this liability was measured right at the fiscal year end. Um, it was about $6.6 .6 million, uh, which is a, about a $300,000 increase from where it was the year before. So, um, you know, what can you do to affect that? Um, Continue investing in your OPEB trust plan. Um, the, the more you can set aside in that, the more it uh, favorably impacts the town. Um, you know, pay it, you know, I guess pay attention to plan design the, the best you can um, if, if there is an avenue to do that. Um, and as far as what's been set aside in the OPEB trust, you had about $1.8 million uh, at, at June 30th, 20, which was a 300. $30,000 increase for the prior year. Most of the increase was the town con contribution during FY20, which was about 270,000. The rest of it was um, 
was your uh, increased, uh, just increased value in the overall investments. So the more the town can invest, the more it's gonna lower that net OPEB liability in the long run. Um, and moving on to the budget, just the last, like I said, the last big piece I wanna discuss. Um, again, this is for FY20. Overall, all things considered, it was a good year. Um, you essentially started the year with a budgetary fund balance of about 1.36 million. And the budget looks as if it was set up to essentially maintain that level at the end of the year. Okay, all things considered. Uh, but in fact, when you consider some savings that occurred during the last quarter of FI20, right? We were shutting down some buildings, cutting down on heating costs, um, weren't sending as many, um, you know, um, personnel out, out onto the streets for various departments. Um, you, you ended up turning back about, or sa uh, saving on the appropriation side about $700,000. Now, that was a little bit um, clipped by, um, by some uh, revenue categories, mainly in the hotel, motel, tax, air line item that came in about $250,000 less than what was anticipated. So the net, net of those two amounts, along with everything else that uh, occurred in the general fund, you, you actually increased your budgetary fund balance by about $450,000. So, um, so that, that was a good positive. Uh, the, the way I, the way we look at it over here. Um, and most of your turnbacks, uh, as I said, you turn back about 702,000 of appropriations. Most of that was mainly in the public safety employee benefits and the state and county charge category. Your, the general fund debt service, uh, total expenditures on a budgetary basis were about 1.4 million. Uh, which equates to about 7.2% of the budget and about 7.5% of actual expenditures for that fiscal year. That's a good neighborhood to be in from, uh, from a, um, a bond rating agency's point of view. Obviously, they, there's other factors that they consider when they determine the town's bond rating uh, whenever it goes through its um, uh, reoccurring reviews. Uh, but that is definitely one area that they do look at. How much, how much is the town essentially investing in its capital infrastructure? Um, you know, they don't necessarily want to see a budget tied up too much in debt service, um, but they don't want to see it neglected either because then that, that reflects, you know, a lot of deferred maintenance, which they don't like to see. So overall, the budget, um, the budget seems appropriately, at least from a, just purely analytical standpoint, seems okay. Um, seems to be right where you want it. Um, so, and as far as any new, so in FY20, no new accounting statements were imp, uh, implemented, standards that are uh, promulgated by the Governmental Accounting Standards Board. Um, the GASB deferred any statements that were to be implemented in FY20, they deferred it to future years. Um, nothing right now is anticipated for FY21, just based on the town's financial statements. Um, other government entities may be implementing new, new standards this year, but certainly FY22, there's going to be a couple that we'll need to discuss um, with management as, they, uh, as we get near the FY22 uh, time period, um, you know, towards next spring or whatnot. Um, other than that, Free to take questions if there are any or comments. I would just say, um, I know I see Linda's here and uh, or, or, I guess it's Lori from Melanson. And so Linda, I just wanted to give you a chance. How, how's this new arrangement working out with the new auditing and uh, accountant and everything else is, it seems like it's a big improvement, but I uh, just kind of wanted to give you a chance. Right. As a combination of between Melanson, who I think Todd realizes was our former auditor. <laughs> so they should be in good shape to, uh, to pick up and correct some of these uh, uh, issues that were pointed out. Um, it's been a very, uh, it's been a very 
good um, combination, especially since um, they were so comfortable and we were too at working remotely. So this just had to be, um, a lot of it had to be remote this past year. Um, and I, I actually, I don't, I don't even, I don't know, Todd, whether you plan on continuing a certain amount of that or, or you think you'll ever get back to the time where you're camping out here for a week and a half. Um, I, I think that we've all seen some benefit from it. I don't, I know you lose something in it, I'm sure, but. Yeah. They're, they're from, from, from our perspective, uh, and I know there's other partners that share kind of my same sentiment, you know, we like getting out and seeing people, right? Mm-hmm. You know, we, we like to have that in-person meeting and, you know, just to kind of get to know the town a little bit. Um, you know, the days of us probably, uh, or any audit firm, any and in, in, in any industry, going out and setting up shop for, you know, like I say, two, three weeks a month, whatever the time is, um, you know, those days are probably gone, but, um, you know, we remain flexible, you know, from client to client. Um, some of our clients are still telling us to do a remote and, and we can do that. Um, other clients were starting to see, you know, you know, you know, let's come out to town or city hall or, you know, the, the high school of admin building or whatever the case is, let's try and get out there a couple of days a week. Um, even if it's just, you know, not necessarily me being in an audit crew, but it's us having a meeting or something. Um, we're flexible. And, and yeah, like you say that this past year proved a lot to our firm. You know, we invested a lot in some of the technologies that allowed us to pretty much work wherever. Um, and, and, and it proved that we could actually execute. So um, going forward, we remain flexible in that approach. You know, it's, we'll, we'll take your direction. I, I would credit to um, our financial team. Um, as always, they have done a fantastic job uh, in supplying you with everything that you needed. I think you we're fortunate to work with a team that we have that has mm-hmm. everything at your disposal, that they have done an outstanding job um, doing their job. Um, you know, our treasurer's office, our collector's office, our assessor's office, Carolyn, um, just to name a few that, you know, uh, go above and beyond their job all the time. And um, Town of Hadley is very fortunate to have them. So I thank them for doing their job and, Making your job maybe a little bit easier, Todd, and I think you know I think you do appreciate that also. Yeah, definitely much appreciated. Definitely, yep. We, yeah, we are looking forward to getting an earlier start and wrap up in twenty one. But we were working against all odds this past year, so uh, I know Lori's done a, a great job in helping us. Uh, meet the deadlines. And one of the ones that you have pointed out about uh, warrants going on too late after July 15th, I'll tell you, there was there there was a little bit of kicking and screaming, but boy, she cut it off at, at July 15th this year. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so it's going to take us a while. We have some yeah. uh, some habits and, and, um, and know that we can usually get a little more time, but but no, not anymore. So um, I think that we are, we are t- trying to get some of our procedures inside tightened up so that we can meet those deadlines and, and um, make sure we, we comply with all those requirements. Yeah. But did you wanna say something, Lori? I know you've, you've been a tr- great help in getting us um, going this year. I'm, I'm glad you said that about July 15th because it's not that I wanna do it to be a, you know, a jerk, <laughs> but um, by law we have to, stop by July 15th. So we can still pay them. We're just going to pay them next year and cumber the funds. So um, we're still plugging away to finish up the final reconciliations. But I mean, 21 looks good. And I think all the things that Todd addressed in the management letter have been or will be resolved before we close 21. So I think we're in good shape. Yeah, you got you definitely are. And um, yeah, we, uh, Laura, I think I may have mentioned it. I think we touched base a couple of weeks ago on the phone. Um, it was a month ago at this point in time, it's flying. But, uh, you yeah, we, we, know, we, I have a staff set aside. Um, forget the dates offhand, but, you know, mid, mid-October anyway, which I think is kind of in line with what where you were thinking for a close anyway. So, or maybe it's a might be a week or two after, but 
Yeah, once uh, once we get the go ahead from Lori and Linda, we're uh, and um, I'll touch base with Chris over at the school too. But uh, once we get the go ahead, that it's all systems go, we're, we'll 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 get cranking on it. Sounds thank great. you very much. All right, thank you. Great report, thank um, you. Anybody from finance have anything for the auditors or the accounting firm before uh, we let them go? I'm good. I'm good, it's a great report. Looks great, thank you. Sure. All right, well, well thank you guys. Thank you. Thank right. you. All right. Good night. Good night. I still have <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna jump down real quick to uh, 3.1 consent agenda. We have warrants AP uh, 2205S, AP 2205-2, AP 2204S, AP 2204, PR 2204, AP 2205, PR 2203, AP 2206, AP 2206S, AP 2207S, AP 2207. And that's all for the consent agenda for this evening. So moved. Second. Okay, motion by Joyce, second by Jane. Any other discussion on the consent agenda? Jennifer? Royal call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chuggalo? Yes. Wiscavitz? Yes. And Parsons. Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, public comments, 4.1 on the agenda. Uh, we'll limit this to 15 minutes, three minutes a person, so everyone gets a turn. If you're here for public comments, uh, raise your hand, wave at us. And Randy just turned his camera on. I saw that first, so Randy, go ahead. I just want to talk about the upcoming special town meeting. I believe, based on what's happening, it's going to have to be an outdoor event. So I just wanted to put that in everybody's mind to think about that. Um, things just seem to be getting worse. And the people that I've talked to so far are not too excited about having it indoors. Uh, and when you, the select board comes up with a date this year, do not put a rain date on the warrant. Let the me and the select board at the time decide when the next day will be. It could be the next day, but if, it, if we put a rain date for the day after the original and it's raining again, then we have to reconvene and, and change the date one more time. So let's just cut out that possible extra step, please. And that's okay. That's just, I just want to make everybody aware. All right. Thanks, Randy. Yeah. Um, all right. I see Mark. Mark, if you're ready, you want to go? Um, I just heard there might be some <clears throat> discussion in regards to the parking on the common. Um, and I am here to um, speak about that. Do you, uh, do you want me to bring it up now? I just. Uh, yeah, I um, Joyce. Choice, go ahead, but uh, we're just not going to vote tonight. We'll just present the idea, and if Mark wants to comment for his public comment, he can. But um, we, just so that way it's posted up properly, we should probably wait till next meeting. That's what we if that makes sense. I had discussed with Carolyn today. Um, I did join into the planning board meeting last night, and um, we have discussed, or I said I would bring forward about uh, the select board posting signs on the east side of the common, which is the north side, but only on the east side would we post, which is near the Eslon uh, uh, restaurant, uh, just so that there will be no parking along the common or in front of the homeowners on that side of each street. So I would like to, for us to post some signs, no parking, because it's really not fair that we are um, doing this to a business owner, making him responsible to tell his patrons not to park on the common when he's trying to run a business. He does have parking available. They need to park where he has parking. Um, and I'm trying to, I joined in with the planning board last night so that 
we could all be on the same page um, and posting. I think uh, Jim Maximoski had suggested that we post as far as there is a telephone pole with a transformer on it um, to that extent so that they don't park in that area on both sides of the street. So no parking up till then um, and also uh, park and you will be towed. So, I mean, those are things that I would like us to discuss at our September 1st meeting, um, just so that people will have an uh, opportunity to think about it. And maybe we can move forward with this. We have been sitting on this for quite some time. And I think that it is the due diligence of this board to post those signs. We're the only ones that can post signs. So uh, if we could, you know, help this out, then I would appreciate it. I would like to support this business and help them out in terms of the parking also. And I'm wondering if we can somehow, in addition to the no parking signs, offer the alternative that Mark is offering with his new parking lot, saying no parking here, but there's parking here. That's for discussion. Yeah, discussion. Okay. For next, the next time. I would like to do this on our meeting so that we would have some type of decision before the next planning board meeting, which is September 7th. I wanted to let the board know that I um, completely support um, no parking signs in the common, not only as the restaurant owner, but as an owner of the property a few houses down from the cafe. Um, I think that it's important for traffic flow and we have the available parking and I'm really, um, it's been a very long drawn out process to get the building approved next door, the old garage. Um, and I'm ready to move on and to bigger and better things. <clears throat> so um, I just want to make it known though that um, our common is very beautiful and we, I just want to ensure that we properly put signs up, but also take into consideration the historic value of the common, that there's just nothing like this around. And as a resident here, you know, I certainly don't want to be sitting in my living room looking at a no parking sign, but I also don't want to see a bunch of cars parked in the common. So, um, but on the other hand, the common is a recreational area and should be used for its purpose. So all these things are, are important to consider when we're posting signs on the common we don't have to we don't have to post that many i mean we're, we'll have this discussion mark you know on the first but i think um getting people used to the idea that there is no parking there and that we want them to park on your property i think that's going to be the gist of it if we can get that and allow that to happen where they're going to park over there and park on that instead of crossing the street there I think that's going to be what our goal is. So, you know, um, please join us on the first for any further comments. Um, we're not making any decisions tonight, but I wanted to bring this forward as I told the planning board I would, um, just so that people will have time to think about it and think what we want to do for the September 1st meeting. I have a question for Mark. Mark, is it possible to go through your southern lot and get to your new lot? No. Uh, no, it's not possible. Okay. So that that's uh, there's it connects to a fire lane that goes around the building to the front of the building. So there is the um, the north side. Uh, we've it's been reviewed by the state. Um, the state spent 18 months in the process of approving the front lot, uh, the the garage lot for drainage, and for the curb cuts. And we were um, expecting a clean approval so we could redo the lot. We have a beautiful plan that's been done and we're really looking forward to having that parking done. Um, it's a little bit unexpected that we're responsible for getting the cars off the common and um, getting the building approved all in the same token, um, but we're able to, we'll, we'll figure it out. I, th I think it's our responsibility, Mark, to get that taken care of on the common business. That's our business. Your business is your business. And so we hope to, you know, alleviate some of that problem for you. So well, yeah. I also want to bring up that, you know, our action ambulance is actually looking to uh, rent space from Mark, which I think is a, a really good thing because they've been ousted from their 
um, other place where we had action ambulance at the beginning of Route 9. So they are looking for a place to put our the action ambulance and um, Mark and them are in uh, some type of agreement um, to have that happen. So I would like to, you know, help that along also. So again, September 1st, we'll be able to talk about this. Well, thank you very much. Okay, Mark, take care. Thank you. All right. Um, anybody else here for public comments? Uh, Randy, are you waving? Yes. I just want to add to what Joyce just said. I was at the planning board meeting last night as well. And just please make sure that that somebody from the select board attends the next planning board meeting because everything that Mark is waiting for is hinging on this decision. So it's imperative that somebody be from the select board be at the next planning board meeting. I'm, okay. more than ha I'm more than happy to be there if my select board wants me to. Sounds good. But uh, our meeting on the first is uh, the, the next planning board meeting is after our next meeting, correct? Correct. Okay. So we can get this straightened out. Okay. Uh, last call, public comments. Anybody? Yeah, I, have a, I have a question. Um, I see that we have Mary Billion and Pamela Rogers here from um, Amherst Housing Association. Are they on the agenda tonight? Because if not, they should not necessarily have to hang out all night. I didn't see housing I, on the agenda. There, no, there's nothing on the agenda for housing. Uh, maybe they're here for public comments. I don't know. No, so they're here. Um, I, I was going to do that update with uh, the administrator's report that Jane and I had met with Mary and Pamela uh, to discuss some of the issues from last week to, to find out that it, it was more so an issue among tenants versus what what we thought it may have been with more communication but we did clarify a lot of that and had a very good dis discussion so if that's okay i just addressed it now instead of the town administrator's report okay jane do you have anything to add to that no that's correct everything you said when did you want me to say anything that you wanted me to say carolyn for housing authority no for, for the oh, oh oh yes yes um you want to do that now? I didn't know if you want to do that now or at the um, end of the. Um, we can do it at the. We can do it at the end. When you do your announcements, yeah, it's good stuff. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, last call again for public comment. Hey, David. Yes. At some point, we need to address TV five, and the recording of the meetings, and the playback of the meetings, and the YouTube of the meetings. Uh, I'd like to have it on an agenda and have a night to talk about it. Because if we don't have all these records in line, we're going to get ourselves into more trouble than not necessarily that we're already in. But these are all public records and they all need to be either released to the public or available to the public. Especially if the state wants to look at any of them. Yep. No, I agree. We can add that to the agenda for next time, too. I know there's been some questions for the lack of YouTube videos or YouTube streaming uh, in a couple of recent meetings. So we just got to make sure we're all on the same page there. And more is better, obviously, for streaming and access. Anybody else for public comment? Uh, one more thing that I had noticed. Uh, uh, conflict of interest law. For all public officials and appointed officials, I see ads on, but really ought to make a general announcement that all these folks need to take that and, and do it every couple of years. I uh, doesn't that go through justice, uh, the clerk's office, as far as that initial ethics training and whatnot. Well, it did, but Ed's following up with it right now. I don't know if you got anything to add to that, Ed, but. All the appointed boards and the elected boards really need to to take this to heart here and get it done. Uh, yeah, so David, to caveat off that, um, it, the certificate has to be filed with the clerk, but somebody has to track it. And part of uh, HR's function is training and compliance. So um, I told Jess that I would track that, get all the board's commissions and employees 
on board and get them to take their conflict of interest training. There's going to be a second piece of that that's going to come out here shortly, which is the open meeting law. Anybody who's part of a public body, elected or appointed, so any board commission, um, <clears throat> with the exception of a charter commission, uh, they have to certify that they received a, a copy of the open meeting law. So that's the uh, that's the initiative we're, we're taking at the moment. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Ed. All right, last, last call for public comment. John, you're done for your three minutes. Okay, thank you for your time. <laughs> anybody else here for public comment before we move on? All right, I don't see anybody else, so we'll keep going here. Um, let's, is Dr. Moser here? If not, can, we can I, wait on I'm going to text her. Are you ready yeah. for her? She, yeah, she's ready to be texted. Yeah. Okay. She's waiting. Okay. Then we'll just hang out for a second. I got her. Hang on. Oh, okay. Hey, sent the text. All right. Uh, Carolyn, do you want to hit anything on administrator report? And then as soon as she jumps on, we'll switch over. Sure. Um, I just give you an update on the update on the ribbon cutting ceremony. We'll be meeting again with Haley, Michael, myself, and Patrick tomorrow. Um, I've been getting good responses from the governor and lieutenant governor schedulers. They're not, they're not writing back to say we're not going to be there. They're actually responding to see what, what the agenda is going to look like and a little bit more detail. So we'll be refining that tomorrow. Um, but it's on schedule and um, we'll keep you updated. Uh, so as you may know, um, an article um, was approved a few, I, th I think it was a few years ago, maybe 2019 to secure funding for a DPW, DPW feasibility study for a new building. That, that did get put on the back burner as the new other buildings um, were built and put online. Um, but Chris and I met, we still, so we have that amount of money for the feasibility, feasibility study set aside. So. Um, Chris and I met with a firm to, to tour our DPW facility, um, and we um, they put pointed out a lot of good information and in how to move forward on that. The only reason I'm bringing that up now is because um, that for a DPW building and the design and building that is a few years out, as as well as you well know. But this recent wet weather has really um, had an impact on the temporary trailers that the administrative staff is in, as well as the, the trailer that where uh, the employees, um, the laborers take their break. Um, I am very concerned about um, the deterioration. I, and again, this really wet weather just really brought it to a point of area of concern. Um, I do think those trailers need to be uh, replaced with a truly temporary trailers, whether it's leased or built. And I'm going to be um, researching that and bringing that to your attention. Um, and that, again, would be temporary until we move forward with looking at a new DPW building. Um, but I did want to give you the heads up that um, I, I, I do think it's in your best interest to, um, you know, just to let me research that so that I could pers uh, I could bring a plan together for you um, at one of our future meetings um, to, and also to bring up possible funding sources to help do that. So. Um, that really was my primary concern to bring up to you. Um, as far as meeting in a hybrid um, model, uh, Jennifer might want to give you a little bit more details, but her and John are going to be meeting. Um, they have met once. They're going to be ordering equipment and they're going to be doing a test run next week. So Jennifer, I don't know if you want to add anything more to that because I know the select board wants to move forward with a hybrid approach. Jennifer, can I come back to you? I see Dr. Moser's on here. So if we can. Absolutely. Just don't let me forget. <laughs> Dr. Moser, are you uh, ready for a COVID update? Yeah, good evening. Good evening. Anyway, just uh, I just caught the tail end of this. Uh, um, the Board of Health really supports having a hybrid model for, uh, you know, committee meetings move, moving forward. So, uh, you know, as soon as we can get that set up, that would be great. I've, I've heard from concerned 
people who, you know, wanted to attend committee meetings, but did, didn't want to go in person. So that's, that's terrific. Hopefully that'll get up and running soon. Uh, COVID, I, uh, the CDC has uh, four categories, the low, moderate, substantial, and high. It goes by county. Uh, Hampshire County just moved from moderate to substantial. Uh, our neighbors in Berkshire County and Hamden County are uh, at the highest level. Uh, the CDC is recommending that all counties in substantial and high uh, have indoor masking. Um, so that's, that's where we are right now uh, as, as far as the pandemic goes. Um, the Board of Health will be meeting Thursday uh, and we will discuss uh, issuing a uh, mandatory uh, indoor mask order. Um, I don't know what else anybody wants to hear, details or data. Uh, yeah, I was gonna ask cases, how have the cases been? I know we talked a couple weeks ago, but um, you know, what have you, what's the trend? They're going up. Uh, I just got the state report now. Uh, Hadley had seven reported cases over the last two weeks. We've been at zero for a long time. So, uh, and uh, Northampton I can't, was up to, I think, maybe 40 and Amherst 35. Don't, don't quote me on the exact numbers, but that's... Uh, oh, that's I heard that Northampton was six when they put their mask mandate in. What's that, Amy? I'm sorry. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I had heard that um, Northampton was at six cases when they put their mask mandate in. Uh, you know, I'm, I, my hearing is not good, but I'm having a very hard time understanding what you're... Oh, can you guys not hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Welcome. Yeah. Um, so I actually work at the three county fair office and the general manager there went to... Uh, the meeting and they put the mask mandate in in Northampton when they had six cases. Yes. How long ago was that, Amy? That was last week. Yeah, Northampton has a mask mandate and Amherst has a mask mandate for in right. Northampton put theirs in when there was six cases. But maybe there, I I believe there are more than that now, Amy. I know that. Um, and Susan, you can help me verify this, but I know there are cases in-house at Cooley right now uh, mm -hmm. with patients that have it. And the problem is um, I've masked up now for the last two weeks, um, even when I'm out of town and I go into another store elsewhere. Um, the problem is, is this uh, Delta that we're having um, and not knowing, I know people um, that are close to me that have had been vaccinated, but have been now diagnosed with COVID. So somehow there, it's breaking through the vaccine that we have gotten, and it doesn't make any difference which vaccine that you got. You can also be a carrier and expose yourself to another uh, person, even though you may not have any symptoms or signs of it. So I'm in total agreement at this point. I, I know that I've been watching our Mass General, uh, what we're having to do, we're going to be now masking up again and goggling uh, to be within six feet or being in any contact with any patient. So it's, it, it's coming down the road. We now have a little bit more coming along. And I think for people's safety and not knowing if you're a transmitter, um, even though you've been vaccinated, you could still transmit to other people. So I, I'm totally in favor of people masking up when they go into these large stores, grocery stores, Walmart. I believe when I was up north last week, I did see on a news channel that Walmart had put out uh, nationwide that they wanted all of their stores to be masked. I don't know if that is because now we're going by county or towns or whatever. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to say I, I do support this, uh, Susan. So you, you have me behind you on this. Well, I also think that a mask mandate, if it helps, and it will help keep numbers down, will help the economy grow. So Correct. we don't have to go back into a heavy lockdown. Correct. I, you know, wearing a mask is minor compared to what we had to do before. So I, I think people should just do it and 
buckle up and lip their zips, zip their lips. <laughs> Get that one right. <laughs> just do it, you know, like the old saying, just do it. Anything else for an update, Dr. Moser? Uh, yes, we are waiting for delivery of, from the state of uh, Buy and Acts Now rapid COVID tests, which the state is supplying to any board of health that requests it. And uh, when I see something for free, I grab it. So um, uh, I've been uh, in conversation with the fire chief and uh, uh, he's, uh, you know, identifying some staff uh, that he has who would uh, perform the tests uh, under my supervision. And uh, I think he's thinking of the North Hadley fire station, but we, I don't, I have not heard any details from him, but uh, that, that will be a free service uh, that would be open to anyone, Hadley resident, non-Hadley resident. Just if you wanted to have the test, um, Susan, we could. Yep. So the other thing that's happening is that the school through any, um, has arranged for free vaccines for any town citizen. I can't tell you the dates right now without looking them up, but there'll be two times, one in September and one in October, where you simply go to Hopkins and can be vaccinated. They, they have an August date, James. An August date, I'm sorry. Yeah, they're having a, a vaccine clinic, which is, uh, which is terrific. That sounds great. Okay, and the Board of Health will also be recommending to the school committee that they have all students masked. How about this um, Mass General has come out just this week with uh, offering the COVID vaccine to, again, the immunosuppressed and people that have any type of comorbidities where they would be at risk uh, more so for, um, you know, having the COVID and they're offering it. They're starting to offer it now too. Anything yeah. else? The, um, first of all, everybody should understand the vaccine is working. Okay. Right. Everybody should get vaccinated. Yes. The vaccine was never uh, purported to prevent infection. Uh, it was uh, to prevent serious illness and hospitalization. And overall, it's doing a great job of that. Uh, with the Delta variant, uh, we're seeing more of what Joyce uh, explained are called breakthrough infections, which are infections in people who have been vaccinated. This was expected. Uh, we don't know the number of those infections because if you have a breakthrough infection and you're asymptomatic, you don't go and get tested. So we don't know what the rate of that is, but it appears there was a bunch of uh, articles, uh, medical reports released from the CDC today. And one of them uh, indicated that breakthrough infections are increasing. Those numbers are increasing. And uh, as Joyce said, the worrisome thing is that while you may not be sick, you may not even know that you have it, you're, you are, can be highly infectious to other people. And, you know, we want to protect our children who are not vaccinated. Um, as far as the third shot, uh, a booster shot, that's been approved for people who are immunocompromised, people who are um, taking uh, high doses of prednisone every day, people who have had a solid organ, tra kidney transplant, liver transplant, uh, people who are undergoing chemotherapy, and people who have certain specific immunological disorders. Uh, for the rest of us, the uh, current administration as of today is, is talking about giving boosters uh, eight months after uh, initial vaccination, uh, but that has not been uh, you know, approved or formalized yet. It's a little bit controversial in the medical community and uh, if it does roll out, it will roll out similarly to the way the vaccine did, healthcare workers, elderly, in nursing homes, and then the general population. So that's as much as I know about that. So I looked up the dates and the um, two clinics will be August 27th and September 17th from 10 to two at Hopkins, but you need to pre-register 
So you can go to the school site and uh, Hadley Public Schools fax and it will show up. That's it. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, how about triple E? Are you guys monitoring that at all with all the rain we've been having? What's that? Oh, right. Uh, yes, I got a call from the uh, state epidemiologist. What was it last Friday? I, I passed that on to uh, uh, David Phil uh, that there was a sample in the southeast quadrant of Hadley uh, that was identified as positive for West Nile. So our level of uh, Vigilance is higher than it was before. Southeast means along the river. Did, David, did that ever go out on a blast? It didn't go out on a blast. Um, we did put it out there, though. It's on Facebook and okay. um, elsewhere. But um, I don't think, Jane, I don't think it's along the river because that would be south. West, I think it's more over by Hampshire College, Atkins, uh, the reservoir, that area. At least that's on a map what would be southeast, but who knows what their definition of southeast is for the state. So, anyway, the mosquitoes are fierce right now. So, yeah, yes, they are. yeah. And what, um, Susan, can you explain to people what the signs and symptoms would be of, uh, of any type of encephalitis? Well, you know, you don't feel well. Start with fever. You can have muscle aches, headaches, uh, changes in mentating. Uh, as a whole, you know, host of symptoms. Basically, if you get sick, you've got to call your doctor. Um, Flu-like flu symptoms. And actually, are you having a, like a stiff neck also in that area, that type of thing? Well, it, it would progress to that, but hopefully you would, you know, you, you would, have you would think you, well, you would think you would, but some people just well, kind of like pass it off a little bit where they yeah. should pay more, more attention to it actually. Yeah. Well, you know, this was not a case identified in a person. So that's, you know, right. that's a bit comforting. I mean, it was one positive sample. I don't know what their protocol is. I don't know how many samples they're taking every week. I, I, I'm not, I'm not on the in with their with their process. I, I actually heard it on the Greenfield uh, radio station um, coming home from work the other day. And I'm going, oh, wow. You know, so we actually now have something here that people should be more vigilant, vi vigilant about, you know, spraying themselves or being out after dusk and the water and cooling. They sure, they sure should. Yeah. It's, so it's not, it's not a treatable disease. No. I would like to encourage us to have a, a separate way of notifying people beside Facebook, since I represent a lot of seniors, and seniors are not using Facebook as a communication means. Nor are, are many, many other people. If I'm given the information, I can do town news blast and send it out on Mixel. I just have to be given the information. That would be great. Okay. But people also need to sign up for Nixle. If we don't have a sign up, we can't send it to you. So can we put it out there um, for people how to, again, sign up for the Nexel? Absolutely. It's on the front of the town web page. It says emergency notifications. You sign up there or you can text the number 888-777 and type in the word Hadley and they'll respond to you and you hit yes and you are signed up to receive all um, text message alerts from the town. Thank Easy you. enough. No problem. Yeah. Jane, that might be worth um, having um, that at the senior center, that information, because they're going to be more likely to get the information through, through a notification through their phone. Yeah, we'll also try and get it in this month's newsletter that's deadline soon. That would be good. Anything else for Dr. Yeah, did the, did the state say that they were going to uh, do any preventive work in the in the southeast area? I mean, of standing water and stuff like that, like the reservoirs. Are they going to treat? Not, that, I, not that I'm aware of. 
I, I don't like, again, I, I, I'm being very candid here. I don't know what their threshold is. I don't know what their uh, treat local, you know, local larvicide treatment is. I don't know what their threshold is for spraying. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you got a couple of farms down that way too. You know, I, I hate to see it get into the animals. Yep. Well, it but seems like we, so don't, far, we don't have any control over this process, is, is right. my sense. But to be clear, so far, as far as I know, they have not sprayed anything in Hadley or anything in Western Mass, right? Nope, nope. No, I, I know that. I understand that. But I just wonder if they have any plans, you know, because of the animal population down in that area. You got the West Farm and the Cook Farm. And maybe they'd be interested in, in what's going on, you know, depending on exactly where they uh, got the sample from. <clears throat> Anything else for Dr. Moser? Thank you for the information, Dr. Moser. Okay, have a pleasant evening, everyone. You're welcome. Thank you. You too, thanks. All right, I'm going to go back to Jennifer now and talk about hybrid. She, uh, sorry to cut you off, Jennifer, but if you want to uh, go back to that, and then we'll finish up with Carolyn with her administrator report. Uh, this is just, it's very fast. Um, okay. John um, has done some research. He found a really great product. We're going to do a uh, faux select board meeting as soon as the equipment comes in. Um, we're going to use the senior center and give it a test run, make sure we can stream, make sure everybody can be heard. Um, and then we'll let y'all know. Um, I know y'all mentioned uh, September 1st is maybe, or September as the starting date. Um, if we, everything runs right, we'll let Carolyn and David know and we'll go from there. Um, but otherwise we might have to come up with another plan, but we, we think we got it. Okay. I would just like to make a request that, um, we get DPW involved for setting up and, or taking down and setting up the room at the senior center, because I don't believe that either Jennifer should be doing that or the senior center staff. If we're using the dining room and tables need to be moved for chairs to be set up, it's really nice if somebody comes in who is not a senior to do that and help or not somebody who's as busy as Jennifer. So, so Jane, just, one of, if I can respond to that, one of the challenges is going to be um, you have programs in there and DPW gets out between 3 and 3.30. Um, so there, uh, there's that concern. I'd also have to see if, he, if he's able to spare that as well as in the morning, you are, your programs start fairly early. And I, I just, I'm worried about who you, if you, you'd be paying overtime possibly at the end of the day, if they're waiting for you to finish your programs. So we have very few programs that actually happen in the dining room, which is where the meetings are going to be. So I don't think that would be a problem to set them up early in the morning or put them back early in the morning and set them up at the end of the day or midday even. Once lunch is over, I think the dining room's open. Well, also, uh, if we're going back to mandatory masks indoors, September 1st is probably not going to happen because it doesn't make much sense to have to mask up and be distanced from each other. Uh, Zoom is probably going to continue to be a thing, especially if uh, things keep trending in the direction that Dr. Moser mentioned. So we maybe we have a little bit of time to work on this. Okay, we'll we'll be ready when when the world's ready. John and I'll be on it. How about that? Sounds good. Okay. All right. Um, Carolyn, what else uh, did you have from the administrator's report? That was, that's all I had. For the administrator's oh, okay. Report. That was easy. All right, um, let's go down to 6.1 budget proposal and staffing adjustments for special town meeting 21 and annual town meeting 22. Okay, so I'll tell you where we're at right now. Um, so I'm gonna give you an update on where the budget um, came through, um, where we're at right now. Um, looking back at FY21, we are really on target with our revenues. And I want to thank Linda. She put um, that a really good scenario of where we're at and what our target was. And you're going to see that we're very close to what David Nixon's original um, guesstimates were during COVID. Um, she's sent that out to you. We want to give you time to look at that and review. And we'll um, go over that at probably at the next select board meeting. But, but really, we're doing well. But I do want to remind you 
that um, that those revenue targets um, and that budget for FY21 were um, based on a, re, um, a very reduced budget. In fact, three times, and I always say this every time I, I talk about this, but those revenues that, and the budget were um, based on three different reductions when that budget was being planned. Um, so I wanted to go into where we're at with um, replacing Janice uh, as a conservation agent. Um, we are working with a woman who is a conservation who is a conservation agent within, in another community. Her name is Melissa. Gary and I um, met with her over the phone to talk about um, what she could offer and what she could provide um, based on her time availability, whether it would be temporary as we get through this or whether it would be um, permanent. And so she's... Mark, I think that might be your... Um, if you can mute... Thank you. Okay. Um, and she's providing us with a menu of things that she could probably provide with her time, that, which she has available. Um, and so we're still going back and forth with talking. It really would be a great arrangement just to get us through the next um, few months. Um, but what the real gap is that Janice provided was the clerical part of that job, um, which is really important with any land use clerk, whether it's planning, um, ZBA, conservation. What's really missing in Hadley is that key person to uh, be able to answer phone calls or return phone calls from the public, help them to fill out forms, to do the scheduling and set the agenda, and even help with the, the minutes. So what, um, what I've been looking at, and, and Linda has helped look at, uh, and we've talked about it at almost for about a year of where the real gaps are, and having been here for a year almost, um, the number one thing has come up is historically, like planning has, has really needed assistance with clerical and things like that. But as I'm you know, talking with other departments within the town hall, there's also some needs to bring um, the things that we've, we've talked about, you know, um, John brought up with, Zip, with uh, Hadley Media, having all of this information available as soon as possible if someone requests information. Um, we need that support in those smaller boards that don't have any staff to be able to um, get minutes done quickly and thoroughly and really to help set up some of those meetings for posting and make sure everything's posted correctly. So we're, we're putting a plan together that I think we can um, do with um, minimal if any impact on the budget right now or moving forward towards special, uh, our special town meeting to present or um, even to, uh, moving towards uh, the annual town meeting. Um, there are departments have that have money allocated for clerical, but there's no body to do the work. So that we're trying to do some of that, um, putting all of that together and um, seeing what the needs are and what gaps we can provide. Um, but it would mean bringing in um, someone to help with the clerical aspect for conservation as well as a conservation agent, but also using that position in a part-time um, capacity to help the, the several boards that need that type of assistance. Um, so that's where we're at, and we, we hope to have that available at the next meeting um, that will have a clear picture of what the need is, how much it will cost, and what our plan is moving forward. Um, so I just wanted to give you an update because I did kind of get, get into that area with the finance committee last week, and I certainly wanted to make sure you were up to date with that as well. Okay. Thank you. And so that's it for, the, for that uh, staffing update? Yeah, yeah, we, okay. we, we didn't get the, uh, the reports uh, ready until today. So, you know, we want you to have time to look at those before we can go over them okay. for the revenues in the budget. All right. Well, then the last thing we have on the agenda tonight is 7.1. Um, I'm sorry, wrong thing. 7.2, uh, Conservation Commission appointments. Um, we received five letters of interest, uh, Raymond Michkowski, Joseph Boisvert, Edward Fedor, David Boyvin, and Andrew Gnotic. Um, and so those were the letters of interest. What we did was send those over to the conservation uh, committee so that way they could give some input, some feedback to us before we made those appointments. And so, Carolyn, I don't know if you want to talk about that or, or... Jane, did you want to... Jane? As the liaison... 
Sorry, I spoke as liaison with Gary Pellissier this afternoon, and he asked me to speak for conservation. Um, they would like to have conservation not be a six member committee, but a five member committee because having an even number does offers the option of having ties in votes. But more significantly, if it's a five member committee, the quorum is three. If it's a six member committee, the quorum is four. So they are very much interested in having it a odd number. That makes sense, yeah. Okay, so given that, they would be looking at appointing one person and the board voted unanimously that Raymond Michikowski would be the best candidate from this group to appoint. And uh, for those watching at home, their letters of interest and his qualifications are on his letters of letter of interest. That's on board docs. So if you want to read that, you can go ahead. He's got looks like quite a few. Um, so then what we need is a motion to appoint him or somebody else. I think we need to first make the appointment to make it a five person committee. I'll uh, make a to make it a five person get committee. into that. Oh, can Randy. I interrupt, please? I'm making, a I'm making a motion first. Okay, that's fine. I just want to say something before you guys vote based on okay. something that I heard at a previous meeting. I'll second. Okay, a motion by Joyce, second by Jane. And uh, all right, so we'll discuss this motion now to bring it to a five member committee. Randy, go ahead. At a previous meeting, I believe it was said that you could only reduce it by one person per year. I think Jane said that. So my point is make sure that what you're doing is not going to get anybody in trouble. Yep. No, we, uh, I'm sure Carolyn can talk about it, but we ran it by town council along with all kinds of other stuff related to this. And uh, Carolyn, correct me if I'm wrong, but that actually doesn't appoint or, or doesn't apply to this circumstance. We, we can I guess anywhere between three and seven members is what's allowed by the town meeting bylaw. So, but Carolyn, can you confirm that? Yeah, I remember. So to be honest with you, that conversation was a few weeks ago. So um, I, I don't want to, I just don't want to give out the wrong information. I can double check on that, but it, I do, I do remember that we were okay with what was with that number, but I just, I don't want to misspeak, speak, misspoke. Yeah, I think originally, Randy, what had happened was it was to reduce and to reduce was one year at a time. But the problem is we don't have enough of members right now. So we're only uh, bringing it up to a standard that everybody can live with at this point. Okay, I have no issues with it other than what was said previously. That's all. Yeah, no, I understand. I understand your question pretty well, too. Uh, but it was we were just going to reduce it by two. And then Jane had brought up we could only reduce one a year. But then in, and on all the mayhem had that had happened, uh, we're down to five now. So and, and the original thing was three to five, uh, three to seven. I'm sorry. So that's why. I think it's a good thing just to put one on right now and see where we're at. Okay, thank you. Anything else from the board on um, the motion to set the committee membership at five? Uh, whoop. Did I mute myself? Anything else from the board on uh, setting a committee membership at five? No. Okay. All right, uh, Jennifer, roll call on that. Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Wiskevitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so now we're officially at a five member board. And then before we make an appointment, my question is uh, Jennifer, do we want to, and Carolyn, I, I know we were talking about appointment terms so what would be the appointment term here are we talking are we still going to stick with the fiscal year are we going to go calendar year um what would be easiest here to do this the right way 
Um, ComCom does a three-year appointment. They are not a one-year appointment. And so they would stay on the fiscal year and you would stagger them. Um, so it would, you would do it as of tonight, August 18th, but the term would actually be sort of July 1, 2021 to June 30th, 2024. So whoever we appoint June 30th, 2024 expiration. Yes. Okay. Um, I guess my other question was, is the person that we're selecting tonight, um, are they filling in someone's already in the middle of term or are we just starting fresh? Fresh. We, yeah, they would start fresh. Fresh, but short by a month, basically. Yes. Okay. Or actually, almost two months now. So I'll I move. A, I move that we appoint second. Ray Mitchkowski. Second. Motion by Jane, second by Joyce to appoint Ray Mitchkowski. Any further discussion on this? I think if that's who they selected that they want out of the candidates, then I'm absolutely for whatever they want. Okay, anything else? Jennifer, roll call. Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungaloo? Yes. Muscovitz? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Thank you. All right, and thanks to the other four that put in their letters of interest. Um, you know, keep checking back on this. So. There, there are other uh, boards and committees available. If anybody else wants to apply for any other boards and committees, you're more than welcome to. If Can I actually make a pitch interest. right now? The Disability Commission, we've had some interest in that, and we're actually looking for a couple of new members for the Disability Commission to, to bring to y'all to have a, a new commission because they've basically disbanded. They've had no members, but we've had someone contact us with interest, so... Yeah. If anybody wants to join that, it has openings. With TV5, I believe, too, right? We have five openings on TV5. Yeah. On Hadley, let's call it Hadley Media there. On Hadley Media, yes. Yeah. And that's all I have for the agenda tonight. So if there's any announcements or anything unexpected or anything that I missed before we close up. I, I did have one announcement. And Carolyn, you're going to have to help me because this was posted after I had looked at the, uh, my email, um, this afternoon, um, our police officers, uh, actually helped save a life. Um, there was a gentleman that was in a medical crisis that had left home. Um, so between the officers and canine fits, uh, they were able to locate the individual and the officers are officer Douglas seats, Phillips, Marini, who is the handler of K-9 Fitz, and Sergeant Green were on the scene. And they were able to locate this person between our K-9 and actually um, pinging on his phone. Uh, they did find him. They brought him out of a cornfield and were able to bring him to a rescue uh, and to our fire and ambulance. So, um, of course, I'm extremely proud of our police and fire um, for assisting in this recovery. Um, so again, everything works well here in Hadley, and I hope the individual who they found um, has a good outcome. Uh, but again, I thank our officers for doing their job uh, extremely well. So thank you very much. Any other announcements? All right, that was pretty short and sweet for tonight. I like used it. To these. Yeah. All right, so our next meeting is, uh, looks like September 1st. And for now, it'll be, for now we'll stick with Zoom, I guess, and we'll see what happens with COVID and Board of Health and everything else. So uh, I just need a, um, a motion okay. to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Fine, second. <laughs> 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 Motion by Joyce, second by Amy, and any discussion on adjournment.
Jennifer? Oh, yeah, I want to keep going. What? I'm having such a good time. <laughs> I'm going to mute her. All <laughs> right, thank you. I got to go walk some sheep. Amy, I am so embarrassed that I thought your bunny was a dog. Honest to God. <laughs> I almost thought about having her like right here for the meeting. And I was like, ah, no, that's not professional. You should have had, I should have, didn't see the long ears. That was my problem. <laughs> John, I, you, yeah, I just had one more quick comment for the new library. Um, we just got to dig safe in and the work is going to be in progress on the front lawn on the middle street side to replace all the rocks that they had left uh, with the correct loam and seed, and they're going to be redoing it. Uh, and also the library, I had spoken with uh, the library, and they uh, they said they're going to be taking samples of the roof for the warranty. So just to bring the board up to date with it. Excellent. Sounds all good. Right. All right, be safe, everybody, and have a good. Hold on, we got a vote. Two weeks. Oh, for heaven's sakes! <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, go ahead. Hi. Right. Call vote, Phil. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungalo. Yes. Muscovitz. Yes. And Parsons. Yes. Thank you. Now you can go, Joyce. All right, everybody, <laughs> be safe and have a good two weeks. See you. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye.